Hi, I'm Sue Pickford Chung, and you're watching Anything Is Possible. I'm Patrick Sang, global citizen, investor. Join me as I talk with global influencers for their insight, wisdom, and how they overcame their own personal challenges. Sharing positivity, overcoming challenges, creating one world together. I'm Patrick Sang, anything is possible. Welcome to another episode of Anything is Possible. I have a special guest. It's a new friend of mine, uh, but we have a lot in common, a lot not in common. We would like to talk about it today. She's a best-selling author of the author of the book called Chinglish. Um, it's been recently named the 2020 Bristol Teen Book Award winner, also the Guardian Best Books of 2019. She's also written a lot of children's books, including Rob and Bob, When Angus Met Alvin, Far From Home, um, lots of workshops and, and stuff through like schools and, and children. She's also qualified uh, meditation guide and advocate for bringing mindfulness to children of all ages. Um, like me, her parents immigrated to the UK in the 1960s. Um, she was born in, in Nottingham, never been to Hong Kong, um, and I'd love to really get cracking. She is Sue pickford -Jer. Sue, welcome. Hi, Patrick. Thanks very much for inviting me to talk. So Sue, um, we had a uh, we got introduced by our common friend um, Simone. Simone, thank you. Shout out to Simone. Thank you for introducing Thanks, Simone. To, to Sue. Um, just as wonderful and cheerful. Um, want to share your you know positive and inspiring and uh, great story to the audience. Some I think are happy, and some are obviously not as happy. So I want you to help inspire more young people. You're doing a lot of great work there. So let's start off with some um, boring questions. Um, how has COVID-19 treated you? Well, to be honest, Patrick, it hasn't really affected me that much because I mean, I was work working from home anyway and, uh, and a writer's life really is quite a solitary experience anyway, boo hoo, bring the violins on and everything. <laughs> so we, I mean, we go weeks without seeing anybody anyway. Um, so yeah, it wasn't really uh, much of a drag uh, for me, but I mean, I must say though, um, because I'm on social media quite a bit, the rise in um, Asian hate crime actually worried me a little bit. And um, at some points I was, I do admit, I was nervous about leaving the house sometimes, um, but actually I haven't experienced any animosity at all. Um, and I'm, I'm a great believer in that most people are pretty decent anyway. So um, I think I was just, you know, when, when you're kind of surrounded by negative news, um, it kind of changes your mind, mindset, doesn't it? So I, tr I have to try and stay away from that. Um, so yeah, it hasn't really affected me too much. Great advice, Sue. So the takeaway for that is positively breeds positively, look on the bright side and try to, you know, help people whatever way you can. So moving along on those lines for young people, what kind of advice or inspiration would you give to young people to encourage them during this difficult time? Yeah, so I mean, following on from that, I, I would um, strongly advise that, um, I mean, social media is quite a bad thing because um, it, it's not a kind, it's not really a slice of reality. Um, I think that if you surround yourself with positive people and read as much positive news as possible, I mean, it's, this is not to say that, um, you know, the negativity isn't a reality because it is, um, but, you know, you have the power to control your thoughts and your emotions at any one time. So you, you have a choice to either spend your days in misery um, or find the good in things and, and spend your days focusing on that instead. I mean, it takes a, a lot of hard work to try and do that, um, especially when you're feeling down and, and you just, you know, your go to is, you know, just scrolling through social media and, you know, all sorts of you, you can't control what you see on social media. Um, you, it takes a lot of effort to actually focus on the good things. So it is actually quite a difficult thing to do. Um, but you need to put the effort in, I think, to make that work. So another piece of great advice, it's to limit your time on social media, focus on the positives. Um, don't get the negatives affect your mood. Obviously from, you know, my own general daily routine is that in the morning, you try not to look at your phone immediately, which is a tendency I used to have. I try to wake up, spend five, 10 minutes, just, um, you know, waking up and enjoying and relaxing and appreciating the moment before I look at my phone. Otherwise, you know, you get, 10,000 emails and negative stuff, then and I think that's very practical advice. 
So before we talk about your career, let's talk a little bit about your childhood. Tell us about your childhood. Was it a happy one, unhappy one? How did you grow up? Well, uh, yeah, so it, first of all, let me just say it wasn't very happy. Um, so my, I was born in the Midlands area of England to um, Hong Kong Chinese parents. Uh, they, like your parents, came over in the 60s. And uh, like the other waves of the of British born Chinese, uh, British Chinese, they opened up restaurant and takeaway businesses. And uh, so when we were young, me and my brother, we didn't see our parents much just because they were always busy working. Um, because as you know, uh, those kinds of businesses are so labor intensive. You're talking 14 hour days and the only day they had off was Christmas day. Um, so we were basically, it was me and my brother, uh, mostly for the first sort of um, years of, before our, my little sister came along. Um, and as a consequence of us being unsupervised, we were latchkey kids and uh, we were free. I mean, it was great because we were like free to roam wherever we wanted. Um, and we actually became quite feral. <laughs> um, so yeah, we were a little bit wild and um, we're, we became quite naughty because we didn't get any discipline. Um, so we kind of grew up um, not very in a very conventional way, um, but I think it, it was the same for a lot of um, British born kids, uh, second generation. Um, and I only know that because through writing my book, um, those people like ourselves that grew up in Chinese restaurants and takeaways have written to me to tell me that. Because uh, when I was younger, I thought that the, we were just a handful of people in the whole country that were living like that and I used to think it was very unfair um uh but now I know that it was most of us <laughs> that wasn't alone and they weren't alone so that's nice to know um yeah yeah so uh, it was it was a quite a difficult one and I think comparing myself to my kind of like immediate cousins and relatives um our, our family were an exception and sort of on hi in hindsight now I think um my it was because my dad maybe had some mental kind of issues and back then we weren't to know uh, because back in the 80s 70s and 80s uh it just wasn't talked about uh and especially i, I guess in culturally uh for chinese families it was even more not talked about so it's one of those issues that just got kind of brushed under the carpet um but looking back now i think uh, there definitely was uh, some, some kind of problem with my dad <laughs> yeah Understand. So that's uh, very emotional and, and touching. We we talked about this, uh, you know, on our on a separate uh, meeting last time. And you know, just to share with you, as I went, I was talking to some of my my guys about you. And you know, at the beginning, before I met you, I, I had this um, feeling that you know, all British Chinese, you know, we group all these guys together. And I thought that we would have so much in common in terms of. Um, I think we are in like opposite sides of the spectrum, which we'll, we'll talk about later because I think we touched on this last time, which was, I was so curious and uh, adventurous. And I thought, oh, the Far East, Hong Kong, Chinese culture, all that. And I was just so driven and so motivated and so um, obsessed with the whole Chinese thing that I went my whole life is always going back to Hong Kong, to China, to find out where I come from, the culture, the music, the art, just everything, the Kung Fu, the martial arts, everything. And obviously you went the other way. And I am not saying there isn't a right or wrong. And I think you're right as we get older because of social media and people that you meet along the way, we've all got older. We, we don't want to admit this, but, but yes. And as a result, we find out that there's actually many more of us who went through similar experiences. It's a very interesting thing. So, um, do you have any regrets about the way you grew up that you compared to other like cousins or even to normal, you know, British families that, you know, your, your friends and peers that you grew up? Like, what, what's your like emotional feeling about that? Um, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of regrets. I mean, when you're a kid uh, and you don't understand, you just think, you know, oh, why me? Why is my family not as close as my cousin's family or my, you know, some of the Western kids that I know? who have in-depth conversations with their kids and that, you know, they even hug and things like that, you know, which is really alien to me. Um, I used to think that one of the problems that I had was the fact that my parents never taught us ch to speak Chinese. And so that communication problem was huge. Uh, Cause as you can imagine, not being able to uh, make that connection with people who you're closest to is so frustrating. Um, so even to this day, 
uh, our communication is at kind of like very sort of toddler level and we, we, we find it very, very hard indeed to try and get our points across um, without kind of, um, I mean, it, that's why the book's called Chinglish because it's, it's a mashup of, of Chinese and English to try and get ourselves understood. Um, and then the other problem was the fact that my parents were um, so violent and I didn't see that happening anywhere else. Um, so that was uh, an extra layer on top. And, um, and also the fact that we were made, I'd say, I say made, because we didn't have any choice really, to work in the takeaway from a very young age. I, I'd say I was probably about nine or 10 when I first got put to work in the kitchen. Um, so it was, first of all, it was kind of just general cleaning and stuff like that. And then it was prepping food. So it was chopping onions, peeling prawns, bagging the prawn crackers, that kind of thing. This is on top of, you know, this is like uh, weekdays. So on top of school and everything and homework. And, um, and then Fridays and Saturdays, when I got to about the age of 13, I was um, asked to start serving the customers, which I really didn't like at all because um, on the weekends, you got the junks coming in. And, there were, and I mean, it was, racism was rife back in the eighties. So we'd experienced that quite a bit and it was quite a rough part of uh, Coventry as well. So, uh, you know, lots of fights kicked off and everything. And, um, it was uh, difficult to, and, and just with the general angst of being a teen, just everything kind of like muddled together was just so difficult. That and also things like identity. So, you know, you're born into a country that's not your home country. So you don't really feel like you belong at home. And then you go to school and then you're facing bullying and racism at, at school. So you, you kind of like didn't fit either camp and you just kind of floated around wondering where you slotted in the whole time. And um, because of my kind of like very low self-esteem, I found it really hard to kind of make friends as well. So I didn't really have many people to kind of speak to about my problems. And it's not like these days, it's so good these days, you know, you've got school counselors and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so I couldn't speak to my parents and yeah, I, I didn't speak to my sibling. I mean, they were going through the same thing anyway, my siblings, how could they help? So yeah, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of resentment, but, but you know, in hindsight, it took balls for my parents to come over from Hong Kong and start a business from scratch, knowing, you know, my mum didn't speak any English at all. Um, so, you know, I, I totally appreciate what they did for us, but at the same time, you know, they came over to, to England and instead of becoming uh, integrating and becoming more Western, they did the thing that I really didn't want them to do, which is make us appear even more Chinese by opening a Chinese takeaway, serving Chinese food. We lived above the takeaway. All I wanted to do was just hide because I was so ashamed and embarrassed about the whole thing. Um, you know, kids could, kids just needed to find out that I lived in the takeaway and that was it. Um, I, I just got bullied. So it, it was the English, it was a Chinese part of me that gave me the most grief. So unlike you, I started kind of sort of pushing it away and keeping it at arm's length and tried to be as Western as possible so that at least I fitted, tried to fit in somewhere and, um, and, and I didn't gravitate towards the Chinese part of me because that was giving me grief. So that's, that's why, uh, that's what happened to me, yeah. So that's one of the most uh, touching and, you know, sad um, parts that, you know, I, I, I've heard um, also from our previous conversation. So um, I, I really respect, admire your courage, your honesty, your transparency, sharing this with the world. It's not, a, not an easy thing to do at all. So uh, I'm very um, humbled by that. Um, can, okay, let's not talk about the negative stuff. As you say, you know, we have to focus on the positives. Can you tell me from the sort of like bad growing up experience, obviously growing through it, it was very tough, but now that you're older, you're looking back, um, what did you learn and gain from it? And that you can share with some of our younger viewers who may not be experiencing exactly the same thing, but when they're in sort of despair, grief, um, you know, how should they be dealing with it? My book, Chinglish, is actually written in, in a sort of a diary journal format. And um, a good thing to do is actually, if you, if you have all of these feelings inside of you that you can't express to anybody, that you can't feel like, you feel like you can't, then I think getting a diary or journal is a really good way to actually get all those thoughts on paper and work them out and, and see what your next steps are. Um, but of course, these days as well, you've got a lot of um, 
organizations and charities and people that you can turn to that can help you. Um, so it should be, a, I'm not saying it's easy, but, but it's, um, there's, there's access to, to help more, I think these days, definitely. So obviously, as you mentioned before, um, you, there was instances where you were afraid for your personal safety that if you stepped outside, um, you might get bullied, mugged, beaten up and all this kind of stuff. And I find personally that um, in the UK, um, I don't think the problem is as bad as in North America, um, this whole, you know, COVID hate, all this Asian hate stuff. And in America, it's been, you know, it's been uh, horrible and atrocious. And obviously, you know, you have your personal advice of giving to young people as to what to do, what not to do. But let's talk a bit more macro. How, what do you think is, what, what needs to be done so that we actually change the narrative and the whole you know, blanket hatred out there? It's just crazy what's happening out there. You know, old granny, 70, 80, 90 years old, just being beaten up in the street just because of the color of their skin. Mm, yeah, it is. It's a really awful situation. Um, I mean, I've actually been, a, since writing the book, um, and my name's been out there and I've been seen as somebody that can actually be a voice for the East Asian community. I have actually been approached by um, people who uh, want me to speak on their behalf in a, in a more kind of um, protest and militant fashion. But I, that's kind of like not my personal approach because I, I just feel that um, antagonism antagonizing a group of people um, who are already angry kind of just fuels the fire. So my approach is just a little bit more um, roots really. So I'm actually a, a trained Empathy Lab author. So Empathy Lab is a not-for-profit organization that offers families and schools innovative ways to um, build empathy skills. So they do that by mainly kind of integrating empathy um, education into existing school practices. And then they train authors to do this by, for instance, you know, doing practical exercises like role play and discussion, um, you know, suggesting empathy boosting books and, um, you know, talking about the characters in them and, and just talking about um, what it's like to be in another person's shoes. Uh, and, and knowing that it's important to know another person's full story and not be so judgmental, to teach, you know, compassion and kindness to the next generation in the hope that they will be a more understanding group of people than we've got today. So that's kind of my approach is, is kind of, um, uh, you know, getting at it from the roots level rather than trying to argue back with, with, with groups of people that are already, you know, um, hating. Um, it, it, it'll, this is a, it's a, it'll be a, a long-term process, but um, sometimes these things take, take a while to bed themselves. And um, I, I mean, they, they're, uh, Empathy Lab are actually um, training quite a lot of authors. They wanna get quite a lot of authors on their books um, and it's building and it's growing all the time. So I'm hoping that, that it's going to work. In total agreement. And the reason I say that is that, you know, if you try to change a 25, 35, 45 year old, it's going to be much more difficult than trying to do it at the grassroots level where the person's only 10, 15, 20, when they're a bit younger, they're more, you know, sponge like in terms of receiving information. So I agree with you and fighting violently, um, you know, shoving something down someone's throat is not really effective when you need yeah. to try to educate. And this is a definitely a long, long-term process. It's going to be one, two, three, four, even five generations before things will get much better because we're sort of stoking. We've seen a lot of fires stoked recently post um, Trump administration when it seemed okay to be, you know, racist again. And I think the new is actually not admitting there is racism. Yeah, and that's what the real racism is now. It's different to when we were growing up. Um, stepping aside from this, um, let's talk about the writing side. Um, when did you did you always have an interest in writing, and then when did you start having a, an interest in writing children's books? Well, actually, my first love was always art, 
because I was a, a natural reader. I think I was born to draw because as soon as I could hold a pencil, I was drawing. Um, and, and I mean like on the walls and everything in the house and stuff. Anywhere I could find a blank bit of paper, uh, any a blank space, um, I was drawing on it. And then um, it wasn't until later that I started wanting, what, loving to do creative writing. And, um, but when I got to senior school, uh, an English teacher who read a story that I'd written pulled me over and asked if my first language was English, bearing in mind I could hardly speak Chinese because she thought what I'd written was terrible. And, um, and I was absolutely gutted because I thought I was actually quite good. Um, and it, I, yeah, I was, I was mortified. I actually kind of zoned out. I, I didn't hear everything she said. I just thought, what? Oh my God, I really loved writing as well. So I binned writing after that and just focused on my art. Um, and didn't start writing again until my thirties, um, because it was af after I had my son, and then I started reading him picture books. It kind of reignited my passion for wanting to, to create picture books again. Because when I was younger and um, I was at infant school, I used to love just picking them up and looking through them, and I loved the way that the pictures worked with the words, and I loved the way they felt and everything. And I think that kind of made its mark because it kind of planted a seed and, and, and stayed with me all that time. So by the time I actually had my son and I was reading him bedtime stories, um, I thought to myself, I really want to try and get one of these done. And I kind of, it was just like a, a challenge, I, I guess, I set myself, let's see if I can just get one of these done. Um, and so I did. And um, I sent uh, quite a few submissions off and got lots of rejections like you do when you're a first time writer. <laughs> Um, and uh, it took, I think it took about three years before an agent uh, picked the phone up and, and uh, called me. Um, so yeah, just persevered and, and it happened. So were you, uh, were you uh, a full-time housewife at the time? Um, no, so I was actually um, working full-time. So I was actually writing in the evenings and weekends and um, I'd actually kind of downgraded my job slightly just so that I had more hours to actually do my writing um and yeah and and I was just just really stubborn about it so every time I got rejection I was just like well I'll just <laughs> I'll just keep sending it until somebody I'll get a yes really yeah where do you get this per perseverance from I mean like what's the I mean what the reason I'm asking this question is I want you to share with the audience especially our younger viewers um you know, when do, you, when do you know when to give up? Do I keep trying year one, year two, year three, year four? Maybe it'll never happen. Like, you know, when when's a realistic time to give up and when to continue? When do you know that, you know, I, I, I'm really going for it? Yeah, that's, that's a hard one actually, because I've been the sort of person, I'm the sort of person who is quite sort of stubborn about things and I don't let a no be an answer. <laughs> Um, I think um, that I'm not sure what drove me to keep sending those submissions in. I, I just wanted a yes. Um, I think if you carry on, for, I don't know, if you carry on for like 10 years, then you know that there's, some, there's something wrong and maybe you're not actually quite, you know, quite good enough to, to make it in that industry. And that's when you need to kind of let go. I, there would have been a point when I would have thought to myself, right, that's it then, like, this is not happening. But um, yeah, but it, but it came at the right time, I think. Sure. Um, yeah. So, okay, so you became pretty successful in the children's books. Um, and you mentioned that it was a challenge to get it done, get it published, it's well received, you got your second book, blah, 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 and kept on going. Was there another um, objective whereby you wanted to make an impact through the children's books? At the time, I'm, I've got to say I was a little bit selfish uh, about it and it, it wasn't about um, making an impact really. It was just all about trying to attain that goal that I'd set my mind on, it, like a challenge. Um, and I think for me, it was a realistic challenge just because I've always come from a creative background and it wasn't as if like I'm you know oh I just want to I want to be in a, a champion international basketball player because <laughs> I'm only like five foot that was never going to happen um it was something that was within my industry that I could realistically attain so I wasn't you know going completely skew with um 
but it wasn't until I my sort of third picture book uh, which was my mindfulness one for children because I am actually a qualified meditation guide um, and I meditate almost every day and it wasn't until I was actually um, noticed when I was going to my friends houses with very young kids and they were having massive problems getting the kids to bed like proper screaming fits and everything and I just sit there and think oh my god like this is so awful and they have to go through this every night this this mad kind of routine of screaming and shouting and you know going up and down the stairs and all this kind of thing for hours and I thought um I might as well kind of uh, just you know, mix my two skills together with the mindfulness and my children's books and, and actually write a story where I can incorporate a mindfulness exercise and help keep calm kids and get them ready for bedtime. So um, it, I think that was the kind of like the turning point for me in actually creating work that had a purpose um, for the good of all, um, which, which uh, kind of, was a game changer really for me because it wasn't me just you know making pretty pictures and nice words it was it was producing something that I could give to somebody that would actually help them in the long run that's a great story um Sue um I think you know the takeaway to that is sometimes things are not planned um well in advance but you just make the best out of situations and sometimes there's a bit of like lady luck which helps you to you know pick pick your path in terms of where you want to go. So moving on, um, children's books, and then you have Chinglish, which is totally not a children's book. It's sort of like a memoir based on a fictitious character, based on yourself and your experiences. How did that happen? Um, obviously, you, you've had, you've, the story is there, but what made you go and actually get it published? And um, what did you end up writing and not writing? So yeah, so this is a book that Simone, we, we were mentioning earlier, um, read, and she contacted me straight away and, oh my gosh, I love your book. Um, and uh, the success of it is actually quite surprised me because I didn't set out to do that. In fact, writing Chinglish wasn't my idea at all. <laughs> it was my agent's idea. He, um, what happened was, it, his his mother was actually my original agent and then she semi-retired and passed her job down to to James my agent now and um because I had never met him before he said oh why don't you come over to Oxford and we'll have a chat so we did and then he asked me about my childhood and I was like well, that's a bit weird why is he doing that and so I told him about being dragged up in a takeaway and he said um and I told him the, the whole warts and all story and um he said oh so many people are going to want to hear about that and straight away, I was like, no way. There's no way I am writing a book about my childhood because I'd spent most of my adult life hiding it because I was so ashamed about it. Um, and it brought back horrible memories and stuff. And, um, and he said, well, uh, why don't you just write a couple of paragraphs and we'll see how we go. Um, I was very reluctant to go there. Um, but then I thought, you know, growing up in a, in a Chinese takeaway restaurant environment it is not boring, is it? <laughs> There's a lot of crazy moments growing up in, a, in, a, in an environment like that. So I thought I'd pick a couple of funny anecdotes and send them to him. And then he came back and said, oh, my God, you know, these are brilliant. I want you to write the whole book. So at that point, I was thinking I'll just keep it quite, you know, for a, quite a young reader's age range, maybe kind of eight to 12 or something. Just keep it light and just make it funny. Um, so, so I kind of started writing it and then about a quarter of the way through, my agent said to me, why don't you make this book into something just a bit more truthful and honest and, you know, tell all the dark bits as well. And I was like, no, I don't really, I don't want to do that. That's what I did not want to happen. I don't like where this is going. And he said, look, I don't want to tip you over the edge. It's completely your decision. And I was like oh god I felt like I'd gone so far already I kind of needed to tell the truth and not just just the funny bits like because basically that's how I'd been living my life the whole way up until then was just hiding all the dark bits and just telling people about the funny bits or telling myself all the funny bits 
Um, so I was kind of lying to myself in a way as well all my life. And I thought, yeah, I'll get this, you know, I might give it a go and, and put some of the, the dark bits down. And, and by dark bits, I mean like um, tackling issues such as the racism and the bullying. And then there was, you know, the domestic violence and the mental health issues. Um, and, uh, you know, like I was saying, like all the teen angst and everything. Um, I mean, I've got to say, though, I mean, it's not all doom and gloom, Chinglish. It's actually a dark humour. It's for, for it's a young adult book and it's dark humour. Um, but it does tackle all those really important dark issues as well. Um, and to be honest, it was really, really hard to actually dig all of those um, moments of my life up again. I thought I dealt with, because I've been reading self-help for about 20 years now, and I thought I dealt with quite a lot of it. And it wasn't until, because when you write, and I know not a lot, not, not every writer does, this, does it the same way, um, but you kind of think of a scene and then you play it in your head like a, like a video clip. So it's all kind of, you know, Technicolor and everything. And, and then you write it all down in minute detail. Um, so you have to relive those horrible moments. Um, and there was some that I hadn't got over and I knew um, because it was such an emotional roller coaster. It was some of it was like, you know, belly laughs. And then other times it was like crying and sobbing because it obviously had been so deeply ingrained that um, it needed a lot of digging out. Did you did you do any like counselling uh, before the book? Um, I not related to actually writing the book I had years before I had a couple of counselling sessions about what had happened and we'll probably talk about this later about what happened after I left home the takeaway uh, the reason why I'm asking is that did the counselling not work and as a result you just like you know turned it off that part of your life and you just got on with the bright colourful stuff and then the dark stuff you just threw it away right was the did the book end up helping you to reopen that and now you can talk about it openly transparently and now the new Sue or the current Sue is able to live your life without any you know negative thoughts if you relive some of the moments it's just part of who you are you can't change that and is that is did it become sort of like therapy in a way that that made you able to face that and as a result you got past that yeah I think it definitely has made me think about that part of my life in a more detached way. So the the character, the main character in the book is me, but I changed her name and that helped me as well, um, you know, create that distance between me and that person who was also me. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it helped me kind of think of it as if it was somebody else. And so when I talk about anything now that happened in the past, it's almost as if it's happened to somebody else. It's it's helped that way yeah definitely so that's your, your kind of like um defense mechanism in a way the, the way of you dealing with it right yes yeah that's right in terms of like mental health not just related to you know domestic violence or racism and and and, and, and so forth and just any kind of challenges what what kind of advice would you give to people who who are dealing with mental health issues such as this i you know I'm shy, I'm introverted, I want to talk to people, I'm ashamed to tell people, like, how, you know, what, 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 what's the, the advice you would give? I, I mean, the advice that I would give is just to know that everybody, absolutely, without exception, everybody is going through something. Because I think a lot of the time you just think you're on your own going through these things, but actually every single person in the world has has got issues as well of some description um, to a more you know or lesser degree. Um, so don't ever think that you're alone in in what you're going through, um, because there's always the person next to you going through something else. I mean, there was somebody um, talking about the Asian hate crimes and everything. Um, there was a a lady, um, an East Asian lady who was getting very anxious about it. And, uh, you know, every single um, kind of look that she was getting off anybody in the street was, was related to Asian hate crime. And, it's, and I was like, but, but it's, it's not though, because if you think about it, they might be looking sad because 
you know, that they've lost their job through the pandemic and they've got no money, you know, and they're trying to feed their kids. You know, everyone's got a story. You don't know what it is. Just don't assume that it's because it's so easy to make up stories in your own head, you know, and that's a really bad way to go because that's such a downward spiral of like, negativity and then it just snowballs. Um, always try to think that, you know, always try to remember that that other person's problems, maybe even, you know, a you know, hundred times huger than yours. Um, so, yeah, I think empathy is, like I was saying before, is such a, a great skill to kind of hone in those sort of situations. Great advice, Sue, once again. Basically, we have to be empathetic. We need to think about um, from the other person's standpoint, and that will make us um, be you know, a better human being. And one thing you touched upon, assumptions. I always say, you know, assumptions is the mother of all F-ups. And, you know, we always second guess what other people are thinking or doing. And in fact, we know nothing about whether Sue's gone through a difficult past and, and, and who else. So um, it's great advice. So let's talk about principles and ethics. What principles and ethics do you live by? And how do you uphold them? Um, well, I always think that you should treat other people like you want to be treated yourself. I think that's really important. Um, and I always, I'm a massive believer in, in smile and the world smiles with you. <laughs> because, you know, when you're walking down the street, the homeless person, the big issue seller, I, I smile and say hello to everyone that I jog past in the park. Um, I, I look like a crazy person, but I don't care because, um, because it's so infectious and it's amazing how much of an impact this has on somebody's day. Um, and it's free. Uh, and the actual, just the act of actually um, using our smile muscles fires a signal back to the brain and it releases endorphins. So it's like a physiological effect as well. Um, so I always, I'm always kind of erring I, I always believe the whole kind of uh, make, you know, fake it till you make it thing as well. Even if you're feeling a bit down, you know, try and try and smile. And then that kind of has a ripple effect, but not just on you, but everybody around you as well. You know, and it, it does sound a bit kind of wishy-washy and a bit woo-woo woo, woo sometimes, but it, it, it does work. It really does. I think there's just so much. I mean, I was on a panel of authors just the other day. Um, and we were talking about humour in books and how, you know, as a child, you laugh about 300 times a day. And then you get to add being an adult and you laugh less than 20 times a day. <laughs> like, what's gone wrong in between? I mean, in, with, in the picture book section, so many funny books. And then you get to kind of like middle grade age range and there's still quite funny books. Then I was in Foils in Charing Cross Road the other day and I was in the young adult section. And I was trying to find a funny book. And could I hell find one? There was like, literally, I could count them on my one hand, the amount of funny books. It's this whole kind of culture of why is everything so serious? And we need to teach young kids how to, um, you know, let their hair down and enjoy themselves again. And I know it's very difficult because there's a lot of this kind of PC culture as well. You have to be very careful what you say. Um, you know, you have to be very, uh, you know, tread carefully. Um, but at the same time, you have to remember to enjoy yourself, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, Sue. So, so three takeaways from that. The first one is treat people um, as you want to be treated. Two is smile more. I totally agree with that. I, in fact, scientifically, it's been proven that people mirror other people's body language. So smiling is definitely good. It's free, which is what I love. And then the third thing for you, uh, a suggestion from me is that that's the opportunity. The fact that there aren't that many uh, humorous young adult books, that should be your next project, or maybe you're already working on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Chinglish is dark humor. So I'd, I'd say I'd count that. I mean, people have actually written to me and said, I belly laughed, you know, I, I laughed out loud at this bit and all this. And to me, you know, you were saying before about how would I make an impact with my books? Well, I think humor, apart from empathy, I think humor is really important. Um, and I gravitate towards that in my book because I think, again, something that stuck with me from childhood is that we didn't have many books in the house. Well, we didn't have any books in the house actually when we were growing up, um, apart from the books that were in the school library. 
And um, so my brother and me used to go to the news agents and buy comics. So we were brought up on <laughs> comic strips and cartoons, which were all funny. And, um, you know, they, get, they gave us that kind of joy and laughter in our lives that were missing in our lives. So I think in a kind of subconscious way, I've got to the point where now I'm giving back that to kids. I want to share that joy and humour. I want to create that joy and humour for kids now. I also know that there's another children's, is it maybe it's not children's, but another children's programme that I was growing up watching called Blue Peter. Oh, Tell yeah. Um, I understand that you have a program coming up with Blue Peter. Oh, right. So that actually hasn't been confirmed just yet. So we're waiting for them to, I, to come back uh, and say either yes or no to me appearing as a guest. Um, but it will be talking about my new um, series for younger kids. Um, I don't know. Um, am I allowed to show the cover of the book? Yes, you can show whatever you oh, want. Okay. Oh, right, okay. So as we were talking before about Chinglish, that, that's the book Chinglish, which is the young adult book. And this is my, my series for younger kids, Maddie Yip. Um, so as you can see, it's a um, British Chinese uh, main character, which is nice. Because uh, as a kid as well, and you'd, you'd be the same, um, Patrick, um, not actually seeing yourself in the books as you were growing up. So they were all kind of, they were all white and they were very middle class. You know, you're talking Enid Blyton and Roald Dahl and C.S. Lewis and all that kind of thing. Um, and then it wasn't until I was about 11 and then age, do you remember Adrian Mole by Sue Townsend? Yes. Mm. That is actually, has, was my biggest influence. So when it came out, I was like, oh my God, it's a character that I can relate to. Okay, he's a boy and he's white, but he's working class. He's got a dysfunctional family. He's a hapless teenager that just gets things wrong the whole time. And he's just a bit of an outcast. And I was like, oh my God, this is me. Um, so since then, Adrian Mole, the series, has been a massive influence on the way that I write. And Sue Townsend writes with such honesty and hilarity. And um, so that's, yeah, so um, I love her work. So in terms of like success, Sue, what do you think is your single most important factor that contributes to your success? The thing that contributes to my success, I think, is... I started meditating about far, 10 years ago. Um, it took me a long time to, to kind of get around to doing it because I used to think it was like, you know, rubbish. Like, what's all this kind of sitting still and not thinking about stuff? Like, how's that going to help? So I was really resistant to doing it for ages. And then um, weirdly, I was walking down the street, not far from me, and there's like a, a Buddhist temple in the middle of Bournemouth that I didn't know about and it was advertising meditation classes um on a Wednesday night so I thought oh I'll just pop around then and see what this is all about um and the, and so I kind of uh did the, my first session and it was all very weird um because nobody is used to sitting still and not thinking of anything that's a very very um weird concept for any a lot of people um and then I kind of persevered because with, with meditation, uh, a lot of effort and energy and um, perseverance needs to go into it because it takes, I think about bet between anything between three weeks and three months for it to actually kick in and feel any effects from. So a lot of people give up after the first session because they want instant gratification. A lot of people don't know. They? they want it to work instantly. And um, I, I, I carried on and I persevered only because the people at the temple were so lovely and uh, they invited me to then start uh, actually holding sessions and stuff in the end. And I did, I actually ended up doing all the design and marketing for them and stuff like as well as a, for, as a volunteer. Um, and uh, when it then started actually taking effect, I couldn't believe how much it was helping me because the you know the science behind it so um the clarity that it gives you and the the um the problem solving as well because i find sometimes when i'm sitting meditating um solutions and answers just pop into my head from nowhere and i'm like oh my god i've been just i've been like um you know just stressing about that for so long and it's just come so easily because when you get rid of all the excess superfluous and not needed thoughts that are in your head, you let the ones that um, are useful come to you. 
and then it, it's so hard to and the thing is I used to really push it to people but then I gave up because it's so hard to to um explain this to somebody that's never done it before um it, it's just another diff, sort of level of <laughs> level of consciousness isn't it and and kind of um uh, the language that you use as well is unfamiliar to a lot of people. So I, I've kind of had to stop looking like a crazy woman <laughs> and stop talking about it. But meditation um, for me is a big one. Also um, being healthy. So, um, you know, I, I was, I don't know whether we'll, we'll touch on this later, but I was on the drink and drugs for a, a many years and uh, I became uh, sober about almost four years ago now um, and then you know uh, along with the running and the yoga uh, I've actually started boxing as well because my, my husband's been boxing for seven years and he's just started teaching me um, so being healthy is really important because when you're sound in body and mind you're more primed to actually do the things that you want to do and be able to achieve them you have more focus, you have more resilience, um, you have more get up and go and you've got more energy overall, you know, and so you're able to, to get what you want, um, rather than feeling all lethargic and deflated and sitting on the couch and eating loads of crisps and watching Netflix, that kind of thing, you know. Super advice too. I think uh, two big takeaways, guys. One is uh, meditation is is uh, phenomenal. It's something that it does take a lot of patience. It takes a lot of, but the results are far fetched and and, and so um, enormous that it's definitely you have to keep at it. So, a few more questions. Um, what's your life ethos? My life ethos. Oh, I mean, I guess this kind of. Um, links back to the other question that you uh, were asking before about you know, treating others how you want to be treated and, you know, and being positive and smiling all the time. Um, my ethos is, is positivity. Uh, again, it does sound like a cliche and a bit of a throw, throw away remark, but unless, until you practice it, you don't understand how much of a massive impact it has on you and everybody around you. Um, you know, you do get the naysayers who kind of like, oh, poo poo the whole idea of oh god you know I actually get people saying how are you all so, so positive the whole time like you can't be real like you walk into a room and you bounce in like what's that all about <laughs> you know like how many cups of coffee have you had today <laughs> that kind of thing and it's like no because yeah everybody has a choice you can either start your day off and and you know spend the whole day feeling miserable and down or and that's the thing as well because physiologically if you do that um you, it, it's it's neuroplasticity, isn't it? So your brain kind of like molds and it re, and it rewires itself to the way how you form your habit. So if you say, I mean, there's different people have um, quoted different days, but for instance, a habit is formed in 21 days, and then that's it; it's stuck. Uh, if you if you do something for 21 days running, be positive, smile, uh, then it gets easier and easier and easier. Uh, and the same is for the opposite, you know you just get more and more and more, and more miserable. Um, so it's just being aware that, that you can do that. Um, and there's not enough resources or information anywhere that tells people that you can do this. And instead people get caught in that trap of switching the radio on, listening to the news, it's all bad. Uh, you know, watching the news on telly, it's all bad. Reading the papers, it's all bad. I mean, where's all the positive news, you know? And, and I think that has a really bad effect on the majority of people because that's what they're doing every day is just tuning into all that negativity, you know? So, I mean, if I, I always say, if I ruled the world, I would just turn everything into positive news. And, and it, it would be incredible to see how much the world changes from that, you know? It would be incredible. I love that, Sue, because one of the missions of anything is possible the podcast is one sharing positivity and the reason i started this podcast is because last year when i was you know in, in bed after the surgery i couldn't walk for like two three months and a lot of people came to me like young people came to me asking for advice you know what should i study i can't 
you know, make money, I can't buy a house, Hong Kong, you know, we have a lot of social problems as well. And the reason for this podcast is to interview interesting people, influential people, successful people in all different walks of life, different stories, and just to inspire and to share positivity. Because a lot of people, including yourself, we all faced hardship, we all faced adversity. And it's through these experiences, depending on your attitude and your mindset and how you deal with this problem if you want to call it a problem you know we always talk about it as a challenge if we get past these challenges we'll always we will always persevere and win and succeed and be victorious and that's the whole essence of anything is possible so just on that note in order to finish in anything is possible we want to share positivity overcome challenges and three is to create one world together which means there's no diversity it's all by inclusivity Sue pickford Jung, please share with us your number one advice to our audience, especially our younger viewers. My number one advice would be, nobody can change your life but you. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you hang around waiting for your external circumstances to change, you could be waiting forever because it's not up to that to actually get your life to change. You have to be the change. That is beautiful. That's great advice. and. You know, that's probably one of the best advice that anyone can give. It's all up to yourself. No one can help you. You can't rely on anyone else. And if you take that, you know, under your own um, power and ownership, I think you can achieve anything. That's why we call it Anything is Possible. Sue, absolute pleasure. It's always great to see you because, you know, your smile, your positive energy, your attitude makes me smile as well. And we had a great conversation. I hope that when you next time come to London, we can have a coffee. No alcohol, of course. And uh, yeah, lovely. <laughs> We can, we can talk. That would be great. Thanks so much, Patrick, for having me. Thank you very much. And uh, Simone, thank you for the introduction.